Okay, so what's scheduled for today's session is three chapters, 14, 15, and 16 from part two. And it's very long. It's the, it would be it would be the longest reading if we were to try to finish it all. So <clears throat> um, we'll see how it goes. Um, and I, I'm definitely open to to stopping short of finishing all that because it would be basically just reading the whole time. Um, but let's see how far we get. So chapter 14 starts on 181. Does anyone want to start reading? I'll read. Great. Chapter 14, weight. Weight is a measure of unbalance. It indicates the intensity of desire of any mass which is out of balance to find balance. Every mass in the universe has its proper potential position. Every mass will find that position if not prevented from doing so by the bindings of other masses. Weight should be measured duly as temperature is. It should have an above and a below zero to measure the intensity of desire in masses to rise from the earth as well as to fall toward it. Weight is matter out of place. All matter is a record of its potential at the place of its birth in its wave. Masses of matter, like buoys flowing, floating in the ocean to mark courses for ships, are floating in space to register the electric potential of the position of their birth. Whenever matter is in the place of its birth, it belongs there. It is, therefore, in balance. It floats in its balanced field. In that position, it is weightless in respect to anything else in the universe. Whenever it is taken from its field center or becomes an eccentric part of another field, it is out of balance with the two forces acting upon it. It then has weight, and the measure of that weight is the measure of its unbalance with its out-of-place environment. Weight of matter and measure of electric potential are one and the same thing. Weight is unbalanced. A body which floats has no measurable weight. It is in balance with its environment. Likewise, a dead battery has no measurable electric potential. The ammeter needle points to zero. Its two unbalanced conditions of charge and discharge have become voided by each other. The measure called weight and the measure called electric potential are the expression of force which the, which the two electric opposites of charge and discharge exert against each other at any point in the universe. The potential of all orbits of matter in space in which matter floats is equal to the potential of the mass which floats in it. The plane of our Earth's equatorial region coincides with an equipotential plane of pressure, which is equally balanced in respect to that part of the Earth which floats above that plane, and that part which floats below it. In this plane, the Earth has no weight whatsoever in respect to anything in the entire universe, for it is in a balanced position in respect to the entire universe and keeps moving into a new position only because of the movement of all other masses in the universe. Our balanced Earth is weightless. The Earth could have weight only if removed to other pressures farther extended from the plane of the lens-like wheel of which our sun is the hub. I like that part. <laughs> The lenticular reference, you know, similarity to what Ross says. If it could be pushed toward the sun by some giant hand, it would seek balance in its own orbit when released. Exactly as a man would rise when plunged beneath his own balanced balance level in water. Every freely moving mass in the universe floats in its own equally divided wave field exactly as a man floats in water. The moon is not falling upon earth as generally supposed, for it is in balance with its environment and cannot fall. 
its contracted mass is equal to the expanded mass it displaces in its wave field. For the same reason, a cloud floats in the sky. If one could put scales under it, one would find it had no weight unless lifted above or thrust below its equipotential level. If it condensed into heavier vapor, it would fall to seek a new static equator where it would again float. If it condensed to rain, it would fall into the sea to find balance in a like condition. Weight is not a fixed property of matter. It is as variable as matter is variable. A man weighs less as he climbs a mountain, weighs more as he descends into a mine, and weighs nothing when he floats in water. Unless and until matter is extended from a plane of equal pressure, there can be no weight, nor can there be electric potential. Weight curbs gravity. The equilibrium of sea level is a good example. If that static equator has no dynamic wave extensions, there can be no electric pressures exerted to express in weight, nor could there be weight of waves when waves are not extended from it. Waves above sea level have a positive weight when they fall toward gravity. Waves below sea level have negative weight when they rise towards space to find balance at sea level. Weight is therefore but a dimension of unbalance. Unbalance alone can be weighed, for there can be no weight to balance. Weight defined. The following definitions of weight are in keeping with natural law. Weight is the sum of the differences between the two pressures which act upon every mass. Weight is the measure of the differences in electric potential between any mass and the volume it occupies. Weight is the measure of unbalance between any mass and its displaced environment. Weight is the measure of the force which a body exerts in seeking its true potential. Weight is the sum of the difference between the inward pull of gravitation and the outward thrust of radiation. Weight is the measure of intensity of the desire within all matter to express motion or seek rest from motion. Thanks, BJ. It seems like the, the main um, synopsis of this concept in this chapter is the statement that weight is not a fixed property of matter. I mean, that's, that's the main um, shift in perspective that it takes to get what he's talking about here. You know, in our system of physics, matter is supposed or presumed to have a fixed property of, of weight and mass. Um, but this telling is more of like all matter in motion in the universe derives weight from its relationship to all other matter. It's like a related universe. It's really interesting. That's how it, that's how it occurs to me. It's like everything is in relationship to everything else. <laughs> and there are conditions where everything is balanced. And, you know, there's no, no there's nothing seeking a different potential or a different position because it's in its right place <clears throat> and weight emerges when there is unbalance and then there's the you know there's the perception of weight which is the desire for matter to seek its right relationship in relation in in relationship to um all of the matter around it that's exerting it their forces upon it yeah Over spring break, which was recently, I went to uh, the Space Center in Huntsville, Alabama, with my mom and my nephew and my son. And my nephew and I were on this scale where it weighs, it tells you how much you weigh on Earth, but then it also tells you how much you weigh on Mars or Mercury or or other planets. And I was having a, a 
an insight about, you know, it was like, oh yeah, I, my weight is not fixed. Wait, what? Like, that's, what? Don't I weigh something? Wow. <laughs> yeah. Didn't Ross say something about the, de as we switch to fourth density, the things are getting denser or mass is getting heavier that we can't really figure it out with our instrumentation and it's very minuscule but like it's happening something's changing oh yeah i remember the minuscule like it's hard to measure or it wouldn't it would it would be statistically insignificant or something yeah yeah that. something like that yeah that's interesting that's interesting yeah well, the the photon, I think, I think that like when as the densities shift from one to another, like the photon, like the unit of light, is wound up more tightly, is is becomes more uh, more rich with information and with with light. That's fascinating. The illusory thing that isn't really there gets heavier. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and yet. When astronauts spend like even the shortest amount of time, but it's more measurable when it's like six months or more, the bone density is such that they have to go through a massive amount of rehabilitation because the body decides it doesn't need the bones. It starts di literally dissolving astronaut bones, like osteoporosis to the whatever 10th power or something because and they have running machines you know they they're they're pulling down and they're trying to run and they're trying to keep the density of their bones but it's not enough there's nothing they can um do on the space station that is enough to keep the density of the bones for their return on earth so um it's a it's a real I mean, that's how quickly the body is, is like, oh, well, we don't need this. You know, form follows function is um, is why our bones are shaped the way they are, because there's the, the tension it's being pulled on. So it reinforces um, like the epicondyle of the, the ball of the bones, like it, there's a line that the muscles yank on where the tendons attach to the bone and the muscle yanks on them and the bone reinforces itself because it needs more form there to, to anchor the function of the pull. And so to, to have a discussion of there is no weight and yet see the effects of our density and our reality and our biology's specific growth to, um, our planet, our sphere, our, what are we, sub-logo, sub our, <laughs> um, yeah, that's just, I, I geek out on that, I love it. Yeah, that is cool. One, and also, what you're, yeah, what you're speaking to, too. oh, sorry, uh, let me just respond really quickly. <laughs> yeah. um, it, you're, what you're speaking to just, you know, it, it points to how, um, you know, our bodies can reform to seek balance in different conditions and vastly different conditions. That's fascinating. Uh, go ahead, Kent. Yeah. So there's a difference between mass and weight. I mean, planets have mass, but they may not have weight depending on how they're located or where they are located. And, uh, as to what Nia was saying, I think what Russell is saying here is that not that there is no weight, but that the weight is dependent on the location of something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's dependent upon where we were born or birthed or whatever. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Yeah. Uh, an interesting something, if I may continue on something new. Yeah. Um, on page 183, under our balanced earth is weightless. 
It says the earth could have weight only if removed to other pressures farther extended from the plane of the lens like wheel of which our sun is the hub. So that sounds to me like Russell's is saying that um, if we moved the earth further out from its orbit, then it would have weight and would want to return to its current orbit. Mm -hmm. Sounds like that, right? Yeah. I wonder, is that, how do you all feel about that? Do you think it would? It makes sense to me. It's not like intuitive. it's balanced. Right. Yeah. Relative to the space that it's in, like just in terms of, like I've been getting, been beginning to think of, you know, spheres are balanced by the cube of space around them. And mm -hmm. relative to the cube of space around Earth, like it's floating in space. And if it's floating, it doesn't have weight relative to the space that it's in. So right. that makes sense to me. But yeah. Well, another um, question, Aaron. Do the people at the, I can't remember the name of the university. What is the name of it? USP. University of Science and Philosophy. Yeah. Do they do any research? Um, there's there's a fellow who just took the position they called the science officer, and he seems to be into some research. I'm not sure what the nature of it is. I'm not sure if it's just theoretical or if it's applied. <clears throat> but the institution itself, the organization itself, I don't think they do any right, right, research. okay. But the people who are involved, maybe, you know, through their own interests, okay. yeah, right. <clears throat> right. um, so to return to the point that you just made um, earlier, Kent, the statement on page 182, <clears throat> weight of matter and measure of electric potential are one and the same thing. This is really mm -hmm. important. So I'm going to send out, this week I'm going to send out a PDF from the Universal One that describes the 18 dimensions. So the 18 dimensions, Walter Russell describes, there's there's basically 18 measurable dimensions. There's, there's 18 ways to measure matter. Um, so there's like length, width, height, time, sex, potential, polarity, revolution, rotation, plane, color, temperature, you know, and a bunch of other ones. And <clears throat> once matter is formed, um, it al will always, for its entire life, it will always have the same, um, like, sort of total charge or net charge. But um, its expression can change by adjusting the dimensions. So... I'm bringing that up in the context of like, imagine if someone did put, you know, so I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get it like, why does the earth, why is it weightless? And why does it want to return to the place that it's at right now in its orbit? Um, and from what I understand, it has, you know, like as it continues to evolve, it will travel further away from the sun. All the planets do is what Walter Russell says. And as it does so, its, its revolution and its rotation will change. Like there's a pattern to how planets revolve and, and also um, orbit the sun. And there's proportion there. So, um, so part of what's keeping... So those two dimensions of the Earth, its revolution and its orbit, like its, its revolution and rotation are two of its dimensions, measurable dimensions. And if you if some big hand just came and pushed it out of the way, it would either need to slow down or speed up. It would either need to adjust its revolution or rotation, or it, its, its charge would need to change. Some dimension would need to change to adjust, you know, for to, to adjust its total net um, 
like energy expression. And that's why mm -hmm. it would want to return. So anyway, I'm just introducing a concept. I'm not necessarily expecting this is going to land, but we're going to start talking about the 18 dimensions. It's um, it's the fun, sort of the fundamental lens through which um, Russellian science looks at matter and how to how to how to understand it. And they're all related. All these dimensions are related. So I just wanted to sort of like interject that here, and we'll get more into that in right. future weeks. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you, Aaron. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Keep reading. Sure. Actually, I have a question. Yeah, go ahead, May. Um, so would you repeat the name of the the science thing that you were at and talk a little bit about it? I, I'm not familiar. The folks who publish Walter Russell and Lau Russell's books is called the University University of Science and Philosophy. And they they now host two monthly calls. And last night I went to one of their calls that's focused on science. And they just started it. It was the second call. They've been doing a call, another one focused on kind of like um, the science of man is what they call it. Um, it's more like the application of this, of the, it's more like the, the, the philosophy and less of the science and less of the science. Does that answer your question? It's like the LL research of Walter Russell's work. Yeah. Cause it's a, it's just a little organization. It's pretty neat. Uh, that's just cool that yeah. you have found another little niche um, to plug into it, but I, it, I, I'm, I'm pretty, that's kind of cool. <laughs> it is cool. I'm trying to. Yeah, and they have regular offerings that we all can participate in too. Aaron, Aaron and I have participated, Aaron more, but yeah, your turn. Well, I just was going to say, I've, I'm, I've been trying to, um, get more connected and, um, I think they're either, they're all volunteer or they're busy or something. I just can't, seem to get their attention because I'm, I'm, I've got some projects I'd like to um, collaborate on, but so far, no takers. <laughs> okay. I, I want to know about the projects, maybe not now, but I'm curious what the, what the possible projects are. If you want to share sometime. The missing, the missing piece of what the world needs to really unlock this, the secret of light and unlock Russellian, like Walter Russell's download is a modern model, a map. So not just a drawing, not just a fixed static two-dimensional drawing, like a model, a three-dimensional model, um, and specifically something that could be turned into, you know, interactive. Ooh. And you could turn layers on and off because you can't, you can't view the whole um, system that he lays out in one time it's kind of like the densities that Ra describes like you you know that they're all like they're all sort of different bandwidths you know they're, they're they're different you know they're all in different frequencies so he talks about all these dynamics that you can't really show in one diagram or one drawing or one depiction um and so i want to i want to help build that map build that model i think it would i think it would be transformational in terms of be, people being able to understand what he's talking about i think it would absolutely uh revolutionize people's capacity to understand what is being discussed here. And if it has in the future, as it grows, 18 different dimensions, and then you pick a dimension or two dimensions, that would be really phenomenal. Wow. I yeah. think it would, I think it would require an architect to build that model. I mean, I've got some experience. I've got some, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 I've got some skills that would help with that. Yeah. That's really fun. Thanks for sharing. Mm -hmm. Uh-huh. Okay. So we ready to read chapter 15? Sure. Anybody want to volunteer? I'll read. Okay. Would you mind turning off your video so we can hear, so your audio comes through a little bit more in this. Oh, table? okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Good right. idea. Thanks. Okay.
Chapter 15, the source of our solar energy. One of the greatest mysteries of science is the source of the sun's renewed energy. At the present rate of solar radiation, the sun should have burned out long ago. What keeps its fires burning? What is it that generates heat in the sun to keep it from cooling? One theory is that its contraction generates it, for contraction supposedly heats. But that is not the answer, for contraction does not heat nor generate. Contraction is possible only as a result of generation, not as its cause. Generation must precede contraction. It does not follow it. Heat follows as a result of contraction. Heat radiates. Radiation is the opposite of generation, and opposites act in opposite ways. Radiation expands, and the resultant expansion cools, while generation contracts, and the resultant contraction heats. Here again is the father-mother principle manifesting its law of equal, opposite, and sequential interchange. The cold of expanded space generates the sun's heat by compressing larger large volume into smaller volume. The high pressure of incandescence is born from the low pressure of vacuous blackness in accordance with the law of rhythmic balanced interchange between all pairs of father-mother opposites. <coughs> the temperature cycle. The temperature cycle resulting from balanced interchange between the cold of space and the heat of suns is as follows. Cold generates, generation contracts, contraction heats, heat radiates, radiation expands, and expansion cools. Thus, our hot sun is being generated from cold space via its poles and is radiated back again into space via its equator in accord with the father-mother reciprocative process of inside out, outside in turning, and will continue to generate increasing heat in the sun until it becomes a true sphere. This spherical perfection has not yet been attained, for the sun has not yet reached the amplitude of its wave, where all forming matter becomes true spheres. One opposite borns the other. When the amplitude position is attained, its radiation will then begin to exceed its generation. It will be in the same condition as a man who has just passed his maturity high point when death and life interchange their preponderances. From that point on, cold space will bore a black hole through the sun from pole to pole, and it will expand into a giant ring centered by a smaller sun recondensed from the remnant of its expanding self. Many such ring nebula are visible in the heavens, notably the Lyra Ring Nebula. The stars will tell the whole story. Excellent examples of the degeneration of the sun into a ring or rings by the inside out turning process of negative electricity are the Owl Nebula, map 97, in Ursa Majoris, and the Dumbbell Nebula in Vulpeculae. One can likewise witness this inside out turning process in his kitchen range. Jets of burning gas are seen as a blue and green flame around black holes which center each jet. These gases are negatively preponderant, which means that they are thrusting out from their center in excess of pulling inward from it. Great. So I'm curious at this point if the relationship between the sun and its surrounding space and this idea that's being covered here is making sense. You're Anybody muted, want? Diana. It looked like you said something, but... My thought on it... Oh, sorry. <laughs> My thought on it is that he just totally contradicted contradicted it contradicted it. you know what i'm trying to say 
it sounds like a contradiction. <laughs> How that so? makes no sense. Mm -hmm. How so? Because he just got done saying he just about the whole process of radiation, which made complete sense. I don't know if it's just because of Kent's amazing reading, the way he reread that was just beautiful. Um, so it made total sense. But then to throw that monkey wrench in, like one day, the earth's just the the sun's just gonna be a ring. Like Lord of the Rings is what comes to mind for me, which is silly, but um, and it's just gonna be this ring up in the middle of the of the uh, that because then it for black heart like that so somehow then what it seems like is that there's an imbalance. Then all of a sudden the sun becomes imbalanced with too much cold and then it forgets it's hot. <laughs> I don't know. It's just that's that just makes no sense to me. That's 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 my reaction. There you have there's your comic relief for this evening. <laughs> okay. Thanks, May. I really I really appreciate you sharing that. Um it just gives us it gives us a point to like dig in there and let's 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 see if we can generate more clarity and understanding. So let me just riff a little bit and see if this helps. Okay. Um, so the sun is <clears throat> um, the, you know, the body that is expressing the idea that um, exists in stillness, that exists in the mind of God. And <clears throat> Everything, all ideas that take form in bodies require duration. They require a process to come into form. They don't just blink into form in their in their sort of final in the idea that God has for them. They have to they have to go through a process. And this um, this whole you know thing we're studying, the secret of light, is you know depicting a map of how that process takes place, how it unfolds. So it starts as an idea and, you know, the sun itself started as an idea and then it began to be birthed at a particular place in its wave field. So the sun is, is surrounded by a particular geometry of space. <clears throat> and the point that it's at now is very close to its perfection. It's very close to becoming the perfect body to express the idea that God had for it. Uh, it's not quite there yet. So it's a little bit less than it's at, at, at its midway point. Um, so it's, it's so it's just in part of it. It's it's in a, a particular position in its life cycle, right? So it's going to change throughout its life cycle. So that part that he's talking about where it will eventually sort of turn inside out is 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 a, it's a part of its death process. And it's a pattern that you can witness if you look at nebula and stars, you know, um, that that are not our sun. Um, so that's what he was pointing to at the end. We can see really great examples of suns that have gone well beyond their maturity point. And they've, they've in their, in their death process, they go through a particular pattern. Was that relevant to your, May, was that relevant at all to your, I'm just curious what was, what you felt was contradictory. The black hole doesn't seem like it fits in um, Walter's description of the radiation process for me, because it doesn't mention anything that's like without energy or without form or, you know, to me, even hot and cold has form. So I, I don't know, but I appreciate your riff because you are the master of riffing and I really do. Um, yeah, I appreciate your thoughts. Um, I see yeah. BJ's got a hand, her hand out. Let me just say one more thing. The, so radiation um, is, is, you know, going from the center of the wave field outward and 
uh, gravitation is the opposite force. So those those two forces are always, you know, they're always paired. And what happens in the life of any unit of light, including suns, is that <clears throat> um, in different parts of their life cycle, one or or the other of those forces is going to be in preponderance, what Walter Russell, Walter Russell calls preponderance. So um, as the sun is condensing and becoming a true sphere, gravitation is in preponderance. It's, it's stronger than radiation, but radiation is also there always through the entire life of the sun. They're both present. But in the very beginning, radiation is not, is not the stronger force. Gravitation is the stronger force. And then as it reach, reaches its you know, true sphere point, they'll flip and then radiation will become preponderant. And then that radiate radiative force will drill a hole through the through the center of the sun and eject matter from its equator, and it will become hollow um, with the remnants of the reforming condensing matter forming a smaller sun in the middle. Okay, that makes absolute sense. Well said. Um, and I was also stuck in a distortion of polarity because I was thinking of hot and cold. So I see the the difference. Yeah. Well done. Thank you. Cool. What you got, BJ? Um, I was wanting to share on the same topic because I, um, I get to, I get the benefit of Aaron, like sharing with me pieces that he's grokking, you know, just sort of like throughout the day or at the end of the day, he's like, okay, so I read this thing and I got the, you know, so I haven't like read ahead in the material, but I get little like bits from him. And, and one of the things that you've shared with me, Aaron, is that same process happens um, like in our cells, the cells of our bodies. Um, so like as babies and then and children and then young adults, like our cells reach the like perfect sphere kind of place. And then, you know, the, so the, the radiation and the gravity, you know, the um, radiation has more preponderance. And then at a certain point, I don't know if I'm saying this right. At, at a certain point, the gravitation has more preponderance and then our, our cells begin to like deflate, you know, and, and like, it's part of the the collapse of the body. Um, anyway, so I just wanted to share that, um, you know, similar process as another way to um, point to the uh, radiation gravitation. Yeah. That's what causes skin to sag and eyesight, you know, vision to to degrade and all the body's functions, you know, uh, become less effective towards the end of life because the, the because of this the shape of our cells because of their where they are and their preponderance of life and death the dual forces of life and death acting upon them. So oh, cool. And I have a genetic condition that causes my cells to break down faster than my body can repair them, and that's why. My joints are falling apart. Mm. <laughs> Science. That's the distortion that you are in. Wow. Those qualities. This has been a cool discussion, y'all. Thank you. Good. I wonder where the concept of six density entities co-creating the sun fits into this uh -huh. I also wonder I'm trying to this is another super ignorant question because I haven't studied this but um what is Russell talking about the measure of the sun as we see it and experience it here in third density or is he talking about the entire life of the sun through all the densities of the evolution of consciousness available to this planet? I have had that same question. Um, you know, the Russell's whole system is an octave based system. He talks about the octave. There's the octave wave and then he maps the octave. Um, and I think that there's obviously 
a correlation between the octave that he describes and the octave of consciousness, but I don't think he, he never talks about the octave in in the terms of like the densities of consciousness. Um, and he doesn't have a map of, you know, the densities of consciousness. And um, yeah, so I don't, you know, I, I've had that same question and I don't, I don't know what the answer is, but um, I'm curious to continue to understand the correlation between the two. Could I ask one more quick question? Of course. Are there people in the, that other group that you attend, are there folks who have experienced like a profound sense of the spiritual implications of this work in the way that we, I see how it dovetails with Ra and I see how exciting and fascinating it is. And I see how we should definitely go where we're, where we're excited, right? There's always something good to be gained from that. Um, but I'm still like feeling around as I read this material for the spiritual implications that he might be getting at beyond the fact that we're all one. It's all connected. It's all, everything refers to everything else and has a relationship to everything else. And hello, that's the most important thing that anyone could gain, I think. So like, that's great. But is there anything else coming up for people that you're aware of or for you or for anyone yeah. who's reading this? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, the key sort of applied, the application of this, that's the most tangible and concrete um, is the notion that um, genius as it expresses through human beings is the, the quality of being in touch with our essence, being in touch with like our unique piece of God's idea, God's infinite idea. So when we're in tech, when we're in touch with that, we and we begin to learn how to express that, that's the whole point of this teaching is to express our genius. And it's very concrete and very relatable and tangible. Um, and I appreciate, yeah, I appreciate that part of the teaching a lot. I love that. Thank you. And he 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 dispels, he he does a lot of um writing on dispelling the the notion of genius as being some like. Uh, something that only it's rare. He talks about like genius is self bestowed. You you claim genius when you claim what your unique gift is, and and when you co create with God. You know it's a it's a kind of a there's two parts to it. There's like figuring out what's yours to bring into form, and that's what he says. The point of Walter Russell's story of what the point of life on Earth is is to bring formed bodies into the idea that we carry in its seed within our minds. Because that's what God wants. God wants to bring, give body to, to the idea, the infinite idea. And we each have a piece of that to do, that work to do. Um, one other thing that I wanted to say about this, this, the source of solar energy and the sun and its relationship to the wave, I mean, to its, uh, to its wave field. So the sun is the sphere, is the expression of the incandescent sphere at the center of its wave field. The wave field is shaped like a cube um, and its boundary is invisible. Its boundary is made of still magnetic light. And <clears throat> the relationship between the volume of the sun and the volume of the space surrounding it is a really important point. So the sun, I have no idea how much volume it is, but you know, it's it's big. But, the, but it's minuscule compared to the space that surrounds it. And they're equal. The energy in the two are equal. You know, we think of the sun as being profoundly full of energy and expressing and, you know, generating all this heat and light, which it is. But the space surround it, surrounding it um, has precisely the same amount of energy, but in the opposite expression. So it's dark, it's cold, it's negatively preponderant, you know, all of the ways that he maps the dimensions, the space surrounding it is, is the opposite form, but they're equal, perfectly equal. And the thing that, the thing that solves like, well, how could that be? Is like, well, it's just a volume difference. You know, the sun's energy is condensed into this super small, relatively uh, volume, but the space surrounding it is just diffuse. It's very vacuous. It's very, you know, it's very spread out. But, it, but it's actually, it contains the exact same, uh, you know, it's balanced. 
it contains the same um, charge in opposite that the sun does. And that's how so, that's how it all that's how it works at all scales of light. One of the ways that 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 like that my mind has kind of made sense of that is like to imagine the cube and like all of those qualities or that's not the word that you use, but I always go back to qualities. Is it dimensions? Mm -hmm. The 18 dimensions. Yeah. Um, yeah. Dimensions gets confusing for me. So I like to call that in my mind, I, th I think of it as the qualities. So all those qualities were like equally distributed and equally dispersed within the cube. But then like all of the qualities of the sun started to be condensed and sort of like draw all of those qualities out of the space. Like that kind of makes sense to me. Like it's like a rubber band getting stretched. So like the space, the cube space around the sun is the opposite of whatever the sun is. Anyway, just to share a way that I would kind of map that in my mind. I'll give a little preview of the the part we're about to get to in part three that, that is the diagram that starts to show this idea. Um, I don't know if you can see this. I know it's a little bit small on the Zoom screen, but yeah. Here he uses I the- I think well, I can go. Oh, Does nice. that make it big for everybody? Great. So he uses the analogy of a battery, like a car battery, a lead acid battery. And um, and also magnets. And he, ta and he, and he, he starts to show this- um, curvature and how curvature and volume relate to pressure and how you know you can condense <clears throat> um you know basically what we were just talking about how you can condense charge through um through smaller volume and that it will curve the plane that divides the two volumes mm. um anyway so i'm just trying to like give a little bit of a you know, a pointer towards we're going to be getting into like some some drawings that help to map out these things we're talking about. I know it's hard to just it's just hard to talk about verbally, just talk yeah. about all these things. So anyway, we're get, we're getting close. So I just wanted to share that. Yeah. Um, I want to say I appreciate that question, Diana, uh, about like what are the spiritual implications. Um, you know, cause obviously that's, you know, what Toto is about, like we're here for the spiritual implications, you know, and, and, um, evolve, you know, soul evolution and living with the, with an open heart. Um, yeah. And I've been feeling the impacts of, um, studying oneness through this lens, um, just in terms of kind of grokking oneness you know on a more and more sort of tangible level um but yeah i just really appreciate the question of like okay so what what are the implications what what are, what are we studying this for it's a good question 100 percent. it's a really great question super important what do you all think we have 11 pages left to finish chapter 16, we have 18 minutes. Would you like to just have open discussion or would you like to try to read it? Or what do you have, what do y'all feel? I'm up for reading a little more. Yeah, I imagine so we might not finish the whole thing, but maybe we will. Well, let's see. Maybe we could just decide to finish the whole thing. See what happens. Yeah. Do you want to start us off, Diana, with the reading? Yeah. Are we reading in the boxes, like on page one ninety? We haven't been. I was thinking just the uh, the just the chapter. Okay. I encourage people if they want to to read those on their own. But okay. It's a little cumbersome to do that in our calls. Okay. Was this sixteen? I'm bad at Roman numerals. Yeah, it is. 16, yes. the okay. life principle. The life principle. <clears throat> for centuries, man has been searching for the life principle in germs of matter. 
he might as well cast his nets into the sea to search for oxygen. There is no life in matter, nor is there death, for matter is but motion. Motion begins and ends to begin again, but life is immortal. It has no beginning. It has no ending. It cannot die. Man has long believed his body to be his self, the person, the being. Man's body is but motion. It can have no being. God dwells in man. The person, the uppercase being in man is immortal. Life in him is God in him. The body of man manifests God in him by manifesting life in life, death, resurrection sequences as all creating, decreating, recreating things in nature likewise do. The body of man must be forever reborn unto the endless end to manifest God in him. Hmm. There is naught but birth in this cyclic pulsing universe. There is no death. The idea of man is a part of the one whole idea of creation. All creation is but an expression of that one idea, part by part, each being a part of the whole. God gives an eternal repetition of bodies to all parts of his idea to manifest that idea in wave cycles of the divided light of his thinking. One half of each cycle unfolds the idea into the form of that idea and gives it action for producing that form. The other half of the cycle refolds the idea to give it rest in the light of its source for the purpose of repeating the manifestation in a repetition of that body. A return to rest in the light is not death. It is a return to life for the purpose of rebirth to again manifest life in a renewed body. We do not say that man is dead when he rests in sleep to partially renew his body. We know that he will awaken with new parts of his body to replace those which have served their purpose and disappeared. When man's whole body wears out and needs replacement, he likewise need, rests in a longer sleep. Man's body is but patterned waves of light in motion. Waves disappear into the ocean's calm, but they reappear. The ocean is a part of the idea of creation. Waves express the idea of the power of the ocean, but the power and the idea are in the calm of the ocean, whether expressed by waves or not. The turbulence of the ocean springs from its calm, just as the movement of the lever springs from its still fulcrum. All motion is a two-way extension of stillness. We do not think that the ocean is dead while it is at rest in its calm, for we know that it will again manifest its power by waves of motion when desire is strong enough in it for manifesting it by motion. Waves of light, which give transient form to a man's body, are but his body. They are not the man, nor the man idea. The body of the man is an extension of other waves of father mother light in the sun and the idea of man exists in the still uppercase light which centers the sun man can never die for he is omnipresent uppercase light and he exists everywhere likewise man's body cannot die for man's body manifests a mortal man and a mortal man always has a body in which to manifest this body which extends from the earth disappears into the heavens and the earth, but that which disappears to sensed man of earth has not ceased to be, for its pattern has been recorded for repetition. It still is and will reappear. The senses of man are not attuned 
to the rest of the cycle of man's bodily journey from disappearance to reappearance. But man's knowing reaches out over the entire cycle and man can know eternal repetitiveness of his body when he knows God in him. When water disappears beyond the senses as water vapor and gases, we know they will reappear as water when they have completed their cyclic journey. As man knows the uppercase light in him, he will as surely know that he will return for eons to complete the purpose of manifesting his creator as one part of the whole idea. That purpose cannot be completed in one life cycle, nor in 10 times 10 million life cycles. Man has but begun to express the man idea on this planet. He still has a long way to go. And the body he needs in which to manifest will return to him as surely as the light of day reappears from the darkness of night into which it has disappeared. Let's talk. Let's talk. Okay. One thing that got my attention, I don't currently have something to say about it, but I'm curious if someone else has something to say about it. On 198, uh, a little above halfway. Man can never die, for he is omnipresent, uppercase light, and he exists everywhere. Likewise, man's body cannot die, for man's body manifests immortal man. An immortal ban man always has a body in which to manifest. What? That sounds fascinating, but I don't know what else to say about it. <laughs> Anybody have thoughts about that part? I kind of do, but it's very like from my intuition, really off the cuff here. Oh, yeah. can't have stopped too. I feel like every illusion lives on in perpetuity. In the eternal present. And that the threshold, yeah. Yeah. like the thresholds between them have to exist in order to keep them alive. And I think that they never, none of them ever die or none of this could happen. <laughs> Like there's a, there's a, there's a third density that will always be exactly as it is right now, even though it may not be available to the experience of the particular perspective of the creator, that would be us experiencing a higher level of density, <laughs> you know, yeah. um, that's my take. Oh, my battery's about to die. So I've got to go plug that in. My turn. Yep. Yeah. Okay, so the first sentence is, man can never die for he is omnipresent light, uppercase light, and he exists mm -hmm. everywhere. So he exists everywhere. That's uh, like uh, speaking of the oneness of the law of one. Yep. Everything is one. So mm -hmm. that's, my, that's my comment. Yep. Um, I'll, I'll jump in and say that it makes me think of, um, time space, you know, the concept mm -hmm. of space, time and time space. We have, we have, we have these physical vessels that we, you uh -huh. know, that we call the body in space time, but then we drop them and then we experience a whole other, you know, side of reality in time space. And we still have something that's a body. We still have a body, right? We're still mind, body, spirit complexes. It's just, mm -hmm. it's just of a more subtle nature or something. Wait, we, we're we still mind, body, spirit complexes in time space? Yeah, of course. Yep. Mm -hmm. Energy of bodies. Of course. Yeah. Whoa. Would you say that's the same idea as having one's, as one's light body? Um, Any inkling? Well, on that? I mean, we, I think we actually have, we have uh, seven bodies always in, in space time and in time space, but in space time in third density, we manifest, we potentiate and manifest the third density or the, you know, the, the, the chemical, the, the yellow ray body, but all the other bodies are still present. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, the higher bodies are unmanifested unless we learn how to manifest them. And then I think in death, you know, in time space, the yellow ray body goes unpotentiated and we travel through other bodies. We, you know, in harvest, we, we occupy the the indigo form maker body and we you know it's it's a it's a whole dynamic process. Kent? 
I think it says in the law of one material that also when we die and we go to time space that we at least to begin with we inhabit uh, the indigo ray body mm -hmm. right yeah I think that's our first stop yeah the first stop yeah yeah and then I don't know what happens after that right well it depends on what we need Sometimes right, it's a right. healing process, and we when we go and you know we take on a particular body that supports that process. Mm -hmm. BJ, okay. So the thing that you were just saying, Aaron, uh, about like the yellow ray body, like is potentiated, and then and then we move to another phase, and then it's unpotentiated. That just was it, that. It just clicked for me the parallel between like the the gravitation and radiation, for instance, which one is preponderant, and, and that like the the these different qualities are um, like always balanced, and you know it's it's similar in terms of um, all all beings, for instance, like the way that Ra talks about, like when you look at another self and you see this quality, you know, of like whatever it is that, you know, let's say anger or hatred or whatever, you know, I can find that in myself. It may not be as potentiated, but the seed still exists. Um, anyway, I, I was just, it just sort of like made the connection for me of like, oh, all of these qualities, that quality and its opposite are always balanced in one way um yeah it just i don't know if i'm saying it very well but it just clicked connection nice yeah i get what you're saying and that's that's cool i i appreciate the insight you're sharing diana do you, do you want to still say something um Probably not much right now. The concept of the bodies in in Ra's cosmology is like so interesting, but um, probably doesn't need to be gotten into much <laughs> here. Uh, we but are it's digressing. Very fun from to think about. Yesterday. Well, I could study. I I I think we yeah. I could I could do the whole secret of light as compared to Ra all day. Yeah. But, yeah. Yeah. It's so helpful. I mean, it's we've so all gone through love one first each one of us has come through love one first so i welcome it true everybody here has yeah, yeah. Well, how about we write a book on that that would be fun yes please <laughs> um one of the things that i want to i want to mention a different idea that out of this last <clears throat> portion of the reading just above where pj was pointing to it says uh, the idea of man exists in the still light which centers the sun. Um, there's another portion, I think we've already read it, where he talks about the idea of the, like the violet um, in the meadow and the idea of the tree and the idea, the idea of everything that exists on earth is a part of the, it's in the sun. And it's, and again, you know, tying it back to Ra again, it's like, the sub logos, the solar logos, has made a more specific idea, has kind of taken the general idea of our galactic logos and refined it to make it more specific. And everything that we're experiencing on Earth and all the other planets in the solar system are all part of that idea. And this and this just is saying it in a very specific way toward about you know human humanity. Um, but it's like the idea of man exists in the still light which centers the sun. The still light, which centers the st the sun, is the archetypical mind. <laughs> it's the it's the mind of the logos. It's the portion of the cosmic mind that is our sun. Anyway, I just love that. I love that too, and it reminds me of I don't know if any of y'all are fans of Dea Dova music, but there's a line in one of her songs that is streaming light. That's information. Just calls that to mind. What we need to share that to the to the, yeah. to the group. It's a great song. Diana. <laughs> I keep giving up on my shares and being like, maybe I won't say that. <laughs> None of it's really that important. 
I was just thinking about how he's talking about how we basically get all the bodies we need for the creator to um, express all of its thoughts of all of its ideas, all of mm -hmm. its ideas, parts. And when it comes to us as beings, um, I think that it, that that what is being expressed could be none other than the seventh density mind body spirit complex totality in all aspects of its life cycle because that's as undistorted as you get before you join the octave is is that's like the most the least amount of differentiation possible in order to give rise to existence in the mind of the creator so when walter russell is talking about how man gets to just come back in all these bodies until all the idea parts have been expressed i'm thinking about seventh density mind body spirit complex totality getting its chance to just like become fully informed of the infinite number of possibilities available to that one one being who is just so infinitesimally distorted away from all other beings that they're almost exactly one but not quite because otherwise they wouldn't exist that's all it didn't really need to be said but thanks pj <laughs> I like hearing it. So thanks for sharing. It's interesting that he says it's like 10 times 10 million or 10 times a million, or I don't know how many, I can't, I don't remember what it was, but it's a, it's a pretty profoundly large n amount of incarnations. He's, he's uh, pointing to, yeah. I don't know if that's actually how many we, we get, but maybe. It certainly sounds like more than our third density amount of incarnation. Oh, for sure. But I was also <laughs> including like, four or five Everything. six and yeah yeah seventh sense of the entities don't reincarnate no well no they don't need to recycle bodies that's what i understand it, yeah i think i think i would agree with that mm -hmm. i wonder if it could also include second density mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in that case it could easily come up to that number that's right i mean Totally. Yeah. That's that would do it. If we included second density, that would easily get us up, get those numbers right. up to the millions quite quite rapidly. Might as well throw yeah. a first in there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right, right. But that's really what I was saying was that if you're looking at if Walter Russell might be referring to man as basically the the unit for evolution of consciousness then I would say that a whole bunch of men belong to a mind, body, spirit, complex totality, as long as along with a whole bunch of animals and a whole bunch of minerals and combinations and iterations of those layers of consciousness. So yeah, I, I, I guess that is what I was saying was that I think he's talking about all of those densities rolled into that idea of that being that can only be discrete from other beings because it's this much distorted at the highest level possible. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. I just got this glimpse of like all the unpotentiated forms of humans <clears throat> that don't manifest in this solar system that could if our sublogos chose like, you know, a different, different than the simian ape form to invest for third density like how many millions of species are there of animal that could that could potentially evolve into a third density entity but don't in this solar system and all is there's like it's all these unpotentiated versions of humanity or something and i wonder if those are that's a part of i mean that's got to be a part of you know either the galactic or the cosmic idea of humanity and we're just exploring the the ape version of humanity here in this portion of the solar system or of the galaxy or whatever. Yeah, I'm fascinated with how many second density entities that seem really close to third density, like elephants, yeah. elephants, for example. Right. Uh, corvines, crows, and uh, many others, even okay. some trees like uh, the giant sequoia and the redwoods which I actually think could possibly even already be third density, even though Ra doesn't uh, address that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Yeah. They kind of do, though. I mean, they do about the giant sequoias and the uh, redwoods. Yeah, they say that certain. Yeah, they do in a couple places. They don't talk about the sequoias, yeah. but they talk about how second density entities that have been sufficiently invested can take on, like, can become inspirited. Right. Right. And yeah. become aware of their spiritual nature. Mm -hmm. And there's something else that I was going to say. Oh, places? Is that places? Yeah, place, places. Places yeah. can have yeah. consciousness. Or... But also, I mean, I think it's, it's yeah, Don didn't ask all the questions, but it's possible that there are higher density forms of consciousness living in more limited physical vehicles, just like the Bigfoot situation. Right. Notre Dame comes to mind um, with the places. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Or Notre Dame, however you'd like. Yeah, and could... Mecca. And Mecca. Uh, mm -hmm. What do you call that? That central uh, square in Mecca? Mm -hmm. What do you call that? It has a name. Yeah. The Black Cube. Yeah, the black cube. Yeah, the, hey, or the whole, black cube. Yeah, yeah, or the whole courtyard. You know. Yeah. It's revered by remember. millions. Yeah. Well, friends, we are we are a little bit over time. Um, I really enjoyed today's session. Thank you all for. Me too. Sharing it. Yeah, yeah, it was great. Appreciate the those... new, more spacious container. Yeah, we'll just pick up. We'll pick up on 199. What happens after death next week? And um, yeah, to everyone watch. If anybody's watching this on YouTube, start studying the law of one so you can know what we're talking about. <laughs> yeah, go to the other playlist, the law of one playlist, and start studying it. It's awesome. Aaron right, is friends. a fantastic facilitator for the law of one. By the way, what's that? You are a wonderful facilitator oh. for the our law of one. So. Shucks. <laughs> I need to feed JC before he eats the computer. Good night. Yeah. Okay, good night. Bye, y'all. Good night. Bye. Bye. See you next week. Bye bye.